We're delighted to have in our studio today Ingrid Papich. Ingrid has some uh, amazing stories to tell about her experiences as a young girl through her high school years uh, growing up in uh, Nazi Germany. And uh, Ingrid, uh, nobody will believe this if I say it, but uh, I ask your permission to, say, to tell others that you were born in 1928. So you would have been uh, just about starting school when Hitler came to power. And I was in kindergarten. In kindergarten, okay. And uh, what part of Germany did you? In Berlin, and they were already, right. Hitler was already very strong against the Jews. Very, yeah. very, and you are a very Jew. bad. Well, my, my mother's family is Jewish, so I, in, in, the, in the Jewish religion, I am Jewish. And how were things different from the Jewish students and from the other students in your, in your class? And for every little, every good thing everybody had when they had that fun, we were told to go home or, oh. or don't, don't go in there. And so it was like, really, it wasn't subtle at all, it was no, really No, it blatant. wasn't subtle, it was very strong. And, right. and he, he made us uh, not have any but fun. In, yeah, in, in kindergarten, kindergarten even, can you imagine? Because that, that's, you know, that's, that's just cruel. Even there. Yeah. It was right before, one year before the yeah. other big public school. And now, how did it change over the years, or did it? We were always being, definitely being discriminated upon mm -hmm. for all the pleasures in life we shouldn't have. And when the war and everything started, you know, and the war started, uh, food was being so scarce that mm. we didn't get as much food, we didn't get the same kind of food that really? they got, and we didn't get, you know, and it got a lot worse because of the war because everybody had to do with less. Now, you were and considered to be a Jew because your mother was right. in Jewish tradition. Your father was, was My not. My father was the opposite, and so the extreme, his mother was extremely Nazi already before. Really? Before Hitler even became to power. So how did you relate to your grandmother then? I did not. She, she, she already... Uh, dismembered her Disowned. son. He was not her son anymore oh, when my he goodness. got married. So, my goodness. so she also was very strong in the Nazi uh -huh. regime somehow and made sure that my father didn't get a job, although most, really? most husbands had Jewish wives didn't get jobs and they all oh, tried right? to find and do what they can. Do, were, you, were you afraid for your safety? Were you afraid oh, there would yeah, be a knock were, on the door? And we were scared all the time because we knew a little bit. We had the rumors were going on. Mm. I mean, it wasn't. They, Hitler right away um, had a complete charge of all public announcements. And but you could hear radio stations from other countries. I suppose. No, oh, no, 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 no. no. If we listened to another station, uh, we could do that. It was possible, but illegal. But it but was illegal. strictly forbidden. Oh. And if you get caught, I mean, you'd be in jail for, forever right. or dead or whatever. Very strong. He was very strict. Nobody can understand that here, I don't think. Now, at, at some point, uh, Jews were being taken away, and you were aware of that. Do you have any idea where they were going? I, no. In fact, I... In fact, my parents actually tried, I don't know whether that was true in all families, but mm -hmm. my parents definitely tried to never tell us. My father used to make sure we don't talk politics or religion uh, at home. Okay. Oh, even at home? Yeah, at home. Religion, anywhere. Because, uh -huh. oh, you you didn't know where they put, uh, they put little um, microphones all mm -hmm. over the place and... Mm -hmm. and it was rumored, I mean, we, through the rumors, we did hear things that we shouldn't know, you know, that we weren't supposed to know. Did, did you have any relatives or, or friends that just disappeared and you never well, knew what my, happened? Yeah, my, my grandmother, well, my grandmother got to concentration camp and my, and my, and my mother's two sisters uh -huh. were taken from the Jew, they were in the Jewish hospital and uh -huh. then the... Jewish hospital all of a sudden either disappeared or one had fire. Or they said they sent a, my mother, grandmother, a card that her daughter was uh, um, died in the fire, oh. which she probably did, but in a concentration camp. I uh, think. Yeah. So the two, yeah. so her two sisters, my mother's two sisters and my grandmother, 
and uh, a couple of uncles, I think. I mm -hmm. had some other distant family. Oh, yeah, I mm -hmm. knew a lot, but a lot of them were taken, too. Mm -hmm. So my father was killed at the same time. And I mean, oh. so, it, so my brother and I really had to take care of uh, my family. Now, now your father was time. killed. Was that just an accident, or was, was he murdered? My they found out that he had a Jewish wife, and they oh. hated him before that, and they killed him. So oh, that wow. was happening a lot. Yeah. It was happening a lot. Was, there wasn't anything unusual. So isn't, this isn't the kind of Hate thing you would have known at the time, but you found out later. You're right. I, I didn't know. You're right. Uh -huh. Some of the things, I had no idea. We just were told he was killed in the war. How and much? then he didn't get any money. He never got any money. No. My mother said she never received anything from right. the from the yeah. government, you know. So we had to try to try to be making like when I worked and you know when we worked the the little jobs we did right. they weren't that well known or they weren't you know they weren't that publicized and so we were lucky to so not get caught. So you were being kind of paid under yeah, the table. Yeah, we were not get caught. Yeah, but but and we didn't make much anyhow. But, now most of us who grew up in the states remember high school as. Uh, Going to football games and dances and and uh, you know hanging out with our with our friends and listening to rock and all that sort of yeah, thing. I'm I mean, guessing your high school is a little different. All, all I remember is, is studying hard and trying to be doing the right thing all the time and following whatever anybody wanted me to do. And and I I wouldn't uh, ever except yeah I, I wanted to go to all of it. I remember that mm -hmm. when they went to some were, movies, were there dances I wanted for to example? Go to movies and yeah. yeah I I but I had to work so much and I actually didn't really think that much everybody said how did you feel I didn't feel that much it was it was life and I had to work because we had to have money we had to have food and you really hadn't known I was, anything I else I was I was always the one that uh, made the most money <laughs> oh. with a little bit of money that I made in my life. Uh -huh. I always was the only one that worked in my family, and I always had to, because when my father was killed and my brother uh, deserted with his boat from when he was uh, drafted from Hitler, mm -hmm. he was put on a ship, and they they didn't have anybody who was in charge. Everything was chaotic the last couple of years mm -hmm. of the war, I think, mm -hmm. the last year or the last couple mm -hmm. of years. They didn't have anybody there who was ever had ever been to university. That's why they drafted probably my brother and, oh, yeah. my, and my father, yeah. because they needed people so badly. And so they made him the captain of the ship. And he oh. took. <laughs> so my brother said he was so scared to death because he had no idea how to handle the ship. You know, he was just drafted, and he was 18 years old, just wow. out of high school. Uh. And and so he. He just took a took on a bunch of stuff at the at the um, Baltic, Baltic Sea. Mm. He said he put he told all the women and children want to come on who have they had room for the, them in the boat to come. They're going to desert and and they oh. are they are. Oh. He, I don't know how he did it, but he 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 took the boat with the women and children wow. to to uh, Denmark I oh think, my or, goodness really uh, and then from they Denmark, got away with it from Denmark they or from or one of the I don't know wherever mm -hmm. it was the closest I really don't know the, right. all the details that well but f from all I heard later on I and then the English took him as prisoner as a war prisoner uh -huh. and he had a wonderful time he said he had a much better time than anybody <laughs> in Germany at the time <laughs> Yeah. But but he was but I we had no idea where he was so I was in charge of my mother and baby brother who was born my brother was my little brother was born in the middle of the war mm. so I had to take care of my mother because my mother and my baby brother couldn't do much and uh -huh. couldn't and uh -huh. couldn't make much money and couldn't make any get any food and when the bombs hit our place where we lived the little. Uh, Apartment, we ran out and uh, over all the dead people and wounded people and oh ran out into the woods. And so I had to carry everything we had, and my mother carried my little baby brother, and mm -hmm. we ran out over all those people. It was it was hell. Oh, but I see. don't remember the the worst part. I just remember running and doing, and I knew I had to take care of and take care of some, see how where my mother was going to be. We all lived in the woods for about a couple of years, actually. Really. Uh, on and off, and then we jumped on trains. There were trains coming, so we thought, oh, maybe we get out of here and get into some 
mm -hmm. normal life, and but wow. we never did. We got we jumped in the train, and trains were partially Jews that escaped and mm. French people and prisoners, and wow. so it was uh, very very hectic and chaotic. Yeah. And now the you would have been, if my math is right, about seventeen when the war was over. Yeah, something sixteen, seventeen. Yeah. Six, I was sixteen. How, and a how week did that? Later, how did that change your life? Because things must have been really tough in Germany for quite a while. Well, we were in the woods. We lived in. We still. We didn't get out of the woods, and we mm. didn't get into public notices. So because a lot we, of the housing we, would have been destroyed. Yeah. So we we were, and then Hitler was. That was the only good part about. The life Hitler wasn't. We didn't have to be afraid anymore. He wasn't doing anything to anybody anymore because he was worrying about the whole his own life and his mm -hmm. people and his German people. So, so we we weren't at least we weren't in any under any fear of of our lives anymore. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't. We, we didn't have food and didn't have money and didn't have yeah. <laughs> shelter or anything. So, so you had plenty of problems. But, but when when the war was soon and, and we kept moving somehow, trying to find a place, until we wound up in Czechoslovakia. Oh, really? At the end of the war. Uh -huh. And and I had we heard rumors. We didn't really know what, whether the war was on or off or, or who was winning or who what was going on. But then the rumor was that the Russians were on one side of us and the mm. Americans on the other and, and one or the other are going to come and kill us and come <laughs> and maybe rape all of everybody, in which there were Ber in Berlin every Rus female was raped by Russians that came into the Russians. Oh. So we were all afraid yeah. of getting into the Russian field. And so we were all saying, ooh, I hope the Americans come. And my, my mother had relatives in New York and she said, oh, my... I hope the, we we can somehow get to them, but I know it's not going to happen. And I said, oh, yeah, it'll happen. We will go someday. We'll go to America. She said, no, that'll never happen. We'll be dead before that. But then, but then, actually, later on, I found it was one day after the war was over, uh -huh. and I was in the street somehow trying to find some food somewhere, and this Jeep comes up, and I oh. didn't know it was a Jeep. I had no idea. I said, it was uh -huh. just this foreign foreign car with the a machine gun on top. Uh -huh. The gunner was sitting way up on top of the jeep. I remember distinctly. That what I remember some of those, but I don't remember really the worst part. Like when we had the wounded and the dead. I don't. I blocked that one out. Right. I heard later we we went all through all that, but wow. but I didn't remember that. So I, so I don't have, a... I'm not traumatically involved. So so when. When the war was over, the one day the jeep came up with a machine gun on top and came right at me. I was standing still, frozen, and the jeep came and I said, "This is it again." Okay, now was this is over. Life is really over. And then she, he came and he said, he came closer with the jeep and with a gun. He said, "Do you speak English?" And God, my heart went down, and I, I said, "Yes." I couldn't speak it, but I, <laughs> I, I had some in, in school, uh -huh. in high school. We did. He Hitler for some reason, which is surprised me, still surprises me. Uh -huh. He let us learn English. Uh -huh. English was the main language to learn mm -hmm. in high school. Mm -hmm. So we learned that, and I was more interested in it and more. Uh, apt. I was gifted in, in the languages, so I learned it faster, so I was oh. the best in school. So I, I said, oh, I can speak it, but I couldn't speak it, really, and I couldn't understand it, American or any at all. They said, get in, you, we need you, and they made me get in right away, and we had to go into the, we were in Czechoslovakia, and, and I had to go into the prison and get all the prisoners oh, out, because goodness. they were, they, Amer Germans had put all the Check in prison so many, and we had oh. to get them out and had to put the Germans into the prison oh. because uh, they were being the so still you the became enemy. kind of an interpreter. I became yeah, I was an interpreter. I was oh, actually wow. I have Organic. my passport. I brought a picture of my passport. <laughs> I have a passport of being uh, um, interpreter secretary or something okay. like that. So I was an interpreter mainly. At that time, I was just an interpreter uh -huh. because we had to go in and out, and we worked about 10 hours a day or so, just getting prisoners in and out. And it was so chaotic. And the soldiers I worked with were the 5th uh, Division, 5th Infantry Division 
uh, of the United States Army. So I feel like a veteran because I worked with them from one day <laughs> after the war till um, to, for, for, for six months exactly. Be oh, and they at night, this is where I got my dancing oh. fun. That's why I didn't even think about that. I just realized at night they had a little beer garden. Or the, or the 5th Division also went through Battle of the Bulge, and they were the most wonderful, wonderful group of men and people oh. I ever met in my life. Mm. They were all from Ohio. They, have a, they had an mm. elite group, I think, that right. I worked with because I work with like a hundred guys and I bet from, they were all Ohio. anxious and, to dance with a pretty Fraulein. And I was the only girl, I was the only girl, I was sort of <laughs> cute, you know, when I was 16, 17, and so they all wanted to dance with me. So they had a little dance place where they did their own, you know, where not, no Germans in there. And uh -huh. I, somehow I was, I was really very, very lucky, very, uh -huh. very lucky all the time, because then I worked with them all day. And then they took me right away to their little beer garden. They had a little beer garden, a little mm. hall where nobody mm. was allowed in except the soldiers. And I was the only girl, so I danced with everybody. All <laughs> and I saw the jitterbug. First time I ever saw the jitterbug, I said, my God, I will never be able to do anything <laughs> like that. And you can still do it quite well. And then I know we danced a lot at night. Yeah. We were a horrible time in the daytime because it was very chaotic and oh. very... Families that we had cried and... And you were trying to repatriate all hugged. these people who yeah, had been... Yeah, and when we got the people out of prison, they hugged me and, and they said, oh, they'll never know how to, how to thank us to, get, to mm. get them out of prison. We got it off. So, so uh, uh, you were working with the U.S. military and freeing people who were in, in prison in oh, Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me, we took a family in with... Uh, Kids and I know a whole bunch of people. We, we lived in a barn for a while. Mm -hmm. In a while, for a while, say now and then, some farmer gave us a little barn way out and with the cows and the hen. And we were a little afraid of the animals, but huh. we we that we were at least had shelter. You know that was good. Didn't freeze to death. Freezing. So was the worst now was this shelter. Uh, and so you so and and some Czech people or I was with my mother and my baby brother. Oh, and, okay. And then. And, couple other families, I don't know where they came from, oh. but we lived all sort of in a, pretty much together, you know, in the mm -hmm. woods, everybody was mm -hmm. fleeing in the same time. Right. And so, so we took in this one family that was especially happy, you know, that we, we rescued them and they didn't know where to go. And I said, well, you could probably come in the barn. In our barn, we have a little bit of room there. Uh -huh. And they said, oh, good. So they went with us into the barn and then I, there I learned a big, big lesson of life because when they were with us in the barn, the next morning we woke up, they were gone and all of our little things that we had oh. left <laughs> were gone with it. <laughs> okay. How did you come to the U.S. and when was that? I, I applied for, for um, immigration to mm -hmm. New York because my uncle was living there. Yeah. So he, he had sent affidavits already. And so he, we, we, I, I registered in... 46, and end of 49, about three and a half years later, my number came up. See, you have to wait, you get a mm -hmm, number. Mm -hmm. You get a quarter number of when you <clears throat> can, can emigrate. Right. And so the number didn't come up for three and a half years, so oh. I had to stay in Berlin for another three and a half years. But I was an interpreter secretary at the uh, time, so uh. life was a lot better. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I you, never thought and, about it. And way. all of this experience practicing your English, you were uh, hit the ground in the U.S. And the, uh, with very I, good English. When I first worked, yeah, they, no, oh, they called me they Yankee. Called the Brits. Yeah, they, they called the They called me Yankee because I had only learned the American English <laughs> in Czechoslovakia. So they called me Yankee. Oh, you're a Yankee. And I worked for the British government for two years. Then I changed over to the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, they called me a limey. They said, oh, you speak like a limey. You, you must be a limey. What was it like arriving in the U.S.? Crazy life. How, how did, did you fly over? I or? kissed the floor, like yeah. I said. <laughs> like I remember flying with the last plane. They later told us the last plane that was motorized. <laughs> so it took 28 hours. Oh my and gosh. we were all sick. Oh. Everybody was sick. Oh. The, it was in October or November. A 28-hour flight? It was a 28-hour flight. 
and it was horrible weather. It was storms, oh. so everyone was sick. Okay. We were all sick. Did you sick, fly sick. into New York? Flew into New York and saw the. I remember lifting my head for a moment after throwing up <laughs> the twenty eight hours. <laughs> And, and seeing the Liberty oh. uh, Statue of Liberty, oh my God, was that a good feeling. Yeah. Oh, I said, oh my God, we have now made it. We have been, we... it was still yeah. tough after I got here. But <laughs> yeah. It was still tough for a long time, but, and, and it was tough after the war too. It was also tough in, in Berlin the whole time. Mm. It was <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid, for sharing your story. And we need to hear these stories. We need to. <laughs> Remember yeah. what uh, this was just a little part of it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. The yeah. part here is a lot more fun. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. But uh, it's important for us to uh, to remember those days, so we remember the horrors of war and and uh, well, people never should... go there again. We're very happy to have in studio today Wolfgang Cutter, and uh, Wolfgang is going to uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the Berlin Airlift. Uh, Wolfgang, you were you were uh, born so that you were a small child uh, during the war. With, uh, yeah. Uh, where... Well, I was uh, born in 1935 in Berlin, Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved out of Berlin. When I say we, my family, mm -hmm. uh, during the last few years of the war and came back to the city in 1946. And after the war, uh, the Allies uh, divided Germany into four sectors. What was that about? Yes, uh, by previous agreement, uh, Germany was divided into four zones, mm -hmm. the Soviet zone, the French, British, and American zones. Right. Berlin, the capital of Germany, was inside the Soviet zone. Right. So almost so. like a little island in, in the Red Sea. <laughs> but also Berlin was divided into four sectors, mm -hmm. controlled by the four allies, the Soviets, the British, French, and Americans. Mm -hmm. Now, West Berlin was economically progressing, whereas the East, which was under control of the communists, mm -hmm. was not progressing at all. Wow. Now, now, you were living in Berlin. Uh, how old were, would you have been when this started? Uh, it w I would be 12, okay. 12 to 13. So you remember it well. Yeah, I remember. What, what, uh, what were the people in Berlin feeling about all this, especially you were in West Berlin, right? Well, everybody knew what it would mean to uh, live under the Soviets, and mm -hmm. they had all the hope, which uh, fortunately happened, that West Berlin would be free and stay mm -hmm. free. Mm -hmm. So uh, Clay suggested, uh, since everybody thought that blockade will last maybe a couple weeks or so, oh. to supply West Berlin through the air. Okay. At the, uh, uh, before the blockade, about 15,000 tons of food and supply came into Berlin every day. Wow. Now, by, that was impossible. By train and truck and... Uh, and waterways, like uh, barges, water, oh, yeah. very many canals and waterways mm -hmm. into Berlin. And everybody said, that's impossible. Can't, well, can't fly that much stuff in. Yeah. There were, of course, some uh, uh, supplies in Berlin, and uh, Clay thought they could maintain uh, enough food supplies for a couple of weeks or so. Mm. Well, the U.S. Air Force, uh, and again, there were some very influential people thought, that's a challenge, and we'll take up that challenge, and we'll supply the people through the air. Wow. Uh, unbelievable feat by the American Air Force. Mm -hmm. At the height of the uh, uh, airlift, as it was called, uh, about every 40 seconds, an airplane would land oh in an airport in the center of Berlin. Fortunately, that airport was on the western side. Right. So they had so access it, to an airport in West Berlin. And where were they flying these flights in from? Uh, Munich, Frankfurt, and a small city in the north, Sille. Mm. There were three air corridors. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the beginning, you can imagine, it was a total chaos. Right. Until well, every the, 40 seconds, that's pretty close. <laughs> every 40 seconds. Wow. And the Soviets, of course, were sure 
that this could not be maintained mm -hmm. through the winter. Mm -hmm. The blockade started in June, uh, and they thought the latest by November when the heavy fogs and snow and rain, uh, which you experience in Northern no, right. Europe, because you will can't kill land it. in some of that. Will uh, kill it, you know. Right. And f well, fortunately for us, that was not the case, and the American Air Force, British and French too, to some extent, uh -huh. uh, supplied West Berlin. Of course, uh, we had much, much less food available. Mm. What, what was happening among the people of Berlin and your school compatriots and all that? Uh, how, how were people feeling about it? Well, uh, the Berliners knew what it would mean to live under Soviet domination. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they were very, very supportive. And there was no I, way of, of you guys, if you should want to leave Berlin, you couldn't, no, couldn't get no, out. No, there was no way of getting out. So, uh, one of these flights, a Lieutenant Haverson, he, before landing into Tempelhof Airport, opened one of the cargo doors against all Air Force regulations, uh -huh. of course, and threw out chocolate. Uh -huh. Now, I have to say, a lot of people in West Berlin and a lot of children were always at the airport watching the planes to come in because mm -hmm. uh, they flew very, very low and, and you know, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a sight to be seen. Was there any thought that the Soviets would shoot the, the planes down? Yes, there was, and there were incidents uh, of collisions. Uh, there were, uh, I believe, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think 43 airmen lost their lives. Really? Yeah, it was right. crashes, it was Soviet intervention. They lo launched balloons to disturb oh, the airways. Yeah. Uh, so back, to yes. the, back to the chocolates, though. So the chocolate story. <laughs> He threw our chocolate, and of course the kids picked it up real quick. He went back, uh, didn't get court-martialed, but he had a <laughs> dressing down, but convinced his superiors that they should continue it. Oh! And for months, uh, Harrison and his other airmen, his comrades, huh. uh, dropped chocolate every time they flew into oh, Berlin. Wow. <laughs> Word spread, and hundreds oh. and hundreds of children uh, yeah. came to the airport to pick up the chocolate. Uh, it would just hit the uh, ground and break open. I was one of them. There. Ah, yes, so you, you <laughs> and so I have some personal experience and memories. Uh, about thank it. you once again. Okay, thank you.